And it's really nice to be with the Midland Park Christians again. And with all the difficulties that the world is facing, and yes, we have been following the news from your country um, over the last week and a few weeks. And yes, we are praying for your country. And amidst all of that, it is wonderful to be able to go to a book called the Holy Bible. There is no book like it. And find peace, a message of confident hope and rest, and point you away from broken men and women. I was thinking earlier this week, we're all so broken, broken by sin, broken in so many ways. And no matter where it is in society, we look the greatest the greatest politician, they will disappoint you. No matter who we elevate on a pedestal, the greatest pastor, the greatest church leader, all have their flaws. And at some point, all will disappoint. But we are focused tonight on one man who transcends all others, not one church, one man who eclipses, outshines all others. Every other leader, every other person history has ever known, all must stand in the shadow of this great man. And so we're going to read tonight from the Holy Bible, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And uh, the Apostle Paul who wasn't always a Christian. No one is always a Christian. The Apostle Paul was actually an enemy of Jesus. And uh, he had a moment in his life, it's often referred to as the Damascus Road experience, when he realized the very one I hate and the one I am fighting against is the one who loved me and died for me. And so the Apostle Paul, he's now a Christian. He's speaking in a church or a Jewish synagogue on a Saturday in Antioch, which was in Turkey, real places, not make-believe places. That's what I love about the Bible, like not Narnia or Wonderland or nothing like that. Real places, modern-day Turkey. He had just visited Cyprus. This is his first missionary trip, AD 48, real years. And here's what he's preaching in the synagogue on this particular day. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, notice it doesn't say, and by the church, or by your good works, or your lifestyle, or your reformation. It says, by him, Jesus, all that believe, does that include you right now? All that believe are justified from all things. Now, I just want to go over that verse again. Some of you may not have your uh, Bible open. I'll put it up here for you. And I'll I cut out a couple of words just so you can see it all on my little piece of paper. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, by him, all that believe are justified from all things. It is a wonderful verse. And I am so thankful at the beginning of a new week, um, amidst all the gloom of the uh, COVID-19 and the escalating numbers and those who are suffering, many have died and families are grieving, heartbroken, amidst all of the sadness and the troubles of life, we can open the Bible and point people to one that will bring you no disappointments for sure. I've known Jesus Christ as my savior for 50 years. And I've disappointed him a lot. I've let him down. I haven't been perfect, far from it. But I can tell you, he is altogether lovely. He is perfect. He is absolutely beautiful. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's not a religion that I have. I have a relationship. Don't settle for anything other than a real, living, robust relationship 
with none less than Jesus Christ. Not a relationship with your pastor or your preacher or your priest or your pope or anything like that. No, a relationship with Jesus Christ. So back to this verse then. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. I want you to first of all think of the incredible scope of the gospel message. It says all who believe, no exclusions. It is a message of hope for citizens of your area, citizens of my no matter what their it is a message of inclusion rich poor no matter where you're from on the planet no matter what your previous beliefs were no matter which way you were brought up this message of jesus christ is for all and for all who believe they will be justified made right with god from all things i don't know what you have in skeletons you have in your closet but I can tell you the Bible says that if you believe, you will be justified, not in a court of law, but in God's court, which is infinitely superior. All that believe are justified from all things. So it is a message of inclusion, the incredible scope of the gospel message. Perhaps deep inside you have a sense of despair and disappointment. I can tell you the Bible as a message of confident hope, not a fingers crossed hope. Oh, I hope it's gonna happen this week. Not that kind of hope. When the Bible speaks of hope, it is a confident hope, an absolute assurance that you can look forward and say, look at, I am a Christian. My sins are forgiven. Christ is my savior and heaven is my eternal destination. Not hoping. A lot of people say, well, I'll find out after I die. The Bible doesn't go there at all. The Bible says you will know for sure in this life whether you're going to be in heaven or not. I know for sure. Has nothing to do with Peter Ramsey. His lifestyle has nothing to do with the church that I attend or the Christians that I fellowship with. It has everything to do with the man who died on the cross to save a sinner like me. My hope is anchored to Jesus Christ plus no one or nothing else perhaps you are feeling the pain and the brokenness the hurt the wounds of life the bible has a message of spiritual healing for you maybe your life is empty and restless the gospel message brings sweet peace to your soul are you empty you know i i i've talked to people i've emailed people i've met people I met a man last year who, who tuned Liberace's pianos, who appeared on, with um, Celine Dion playing her piano for all those concerts that she performed out in Las Vegas. And I sat in his, I listened to him play the piano and we had a great chat and he told me the different TV shows that he was a pianist on. And I've talked to a number of people and no matter what their successes are, whether it's wealth or fame or whether they're sports people, athletes, there's still a gnawing inner emptiness. No, I just, um, I have a story on my website about David Wheaton. He's an aging, an aging tennis player. Once very world famous. Now you have, to, it's a little bit of history now, but um, that's that was David Wheaton and he played with all the tennis greats of the world that were contemporary with him. And um, he won lots of money. He was making poor, he was very young in his success. He was making very poor choices in his life. And um, he went on, he played in Munich. Um, he won the Grand Slam Cup. He, he beat Michael Chang in front of a worldwide audience. He won the biggest prize money for tennis ever up until that point in time. And here's what, here's what Mr. Wheaton says about that big win that day. One minute holding up my trophy in front of thousands of fans. I'd won the greatest title of my career. And within 10 or 15 minutes, 
the biggest win of my career, the biggest moment of my life in tennis up to that point, most everyone was gone. Fans all streamed out of the stadium and the chairs were being folded and the banners taken down. It was all over in a flash. I remember thinking, wow, that was really over in a hurry. My goodness, where's the victory lap here? Am I going to be running around the court or what's going on? And it was the first time in my life where I realized that temporary fame and fortune and success, what so many people chase after in life, that wasn't going to be very fulfilling. He said, I remember the distinct thought that my greatest moment of triumph was extremely short-lived. That was a wake-up call. Have you ever had a wake-up call when you realize this is really empty what I'm living for? Is there nothing more? And David began his search. He faced the fact that he wasn't right, right with God. He faced the fact that he was a sinner. He said, I faced the fact that I wasn't a true Christian. You see, going to a Christian church makes no one a Christian. You could travel to Australia multiple times, but it would never make you an Australian citizen. People grow up in a Christian church, but it does not make them a Christian. And he said, I faced the fact that I wasn't a true Christian. Me, a sinner? Me offending God? Yes, yes. For the first time in my life, I saw myself as God saw me. I saw my need for what? Forgiveness. That's what's in the Bible verse that we're reading tonight. Preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Before I return to, to David's life, do you have a moment in your life when every one of your sins were forgiven? It's a great moment. I can go back to it in a flash and think, yes. It was in that bedroom of mine when every one of my sins were forgiven and peace with God entered my heart. Do you have that? Well, this is what David's talking about. He said, for two months, I sat home. I read the Bible. And he said, I repented of my sin. I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. I humbled myself before God. I confessed my years of sin against God. I believe Christ died on the cross for my sin. He said, I was spiritually born. I became a born again Christian. He said it wasn't about getting more religious, going to church, praying more often, being baptized, receiving communion, get, communion, getting confirmed, reaffirming my Christian heritage. Had nothing to do with that. Wasn't turning over a new leaf or good works to justify myself before God. It was getting down on my knees and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, I won't continue on with this story. I have a few other things I want to share with you, but I, I want to just read another quote from David Wheaton. One of the greatest things is being able to put my head on my pillow at night, knowing I am in a right relationship with the God of the universe. I was never able to do that before. He said that simple pleasure is worth far more than the temporary pleasures and the fame and the fortune the world can offer. Yes, I finally had peace and joy, hope, and I could truly say life without Christ is a hopeless end. But life with Christ is an endless hope. So that's what I want to share with you tonight. Life with Christ is an endless hope. This is a great message. I may do a very disastrous job trying to share it with you, but the message itself is a wonderful message. If you're afraid of meeting God in a future day, the great message of the Bible through faith in Jesus, through faith in Jesus Christ, you can be fully accepted. You can be welcomed into God's family immediately, not hoping that down the road I will be. Right now, you can be welcomed into the family of God the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. If you're bothered, if you're plagued, by guilt and hidden secrets of shame in the past. It says, through this man, complete forgiveness is available to you free, free 
Maybe you just feel adrift on the sea of life, going nowhere in particular, pointless, aimless, a sense of wandering, just really just lost. Wondering what what is life really all about? Why am I here? And I told you this is that when I read this verse, it's the incredible scope of the gospel. Here's what Jesus said after he was raised from the dead. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. That's why the Christians at Midland Park are sharing the gospel right now with you. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says that Jesus is able to save them to the uttermost. All that come unto God by him or through him. Romans 3, verse 22 says faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all who believe. So you could never argue I'm excluded. It is for all. Oh, such an inclusive message. Too good to be true, you say? Uh, you think it's a gimmick? You said, I've seen lots of religious gimmicks. I've seen people on TV and they <laughs> fly around in private jets and they're begging for money every Sunday from people who can least afford it. And they're doing it behind a cloak of religion. I know it's pathetic, isn't it? I'm ashamed of that as well. That's why people are skeptical and cynical about people who call themselves Christians. No, this is this is free. You can have your sins forgiven freely. The only price that was paid was a price that Jesus paid on the cross in drops of precious blood. He paid the ultimate price. He gave his life. It's not a gimmick, friend. We can testify personally that the gospel is as good as it sounds. The loving embrace of the gospel metaphor, God wrapping his arms around the world. God so loved the world. So the incredible scope, but I want you to think of the indelible stain of sins. We read the forgiveness of sins. Do you think sin is an ancient concept? Is it relevant in today's world? Absolutely. Sad stains of sin, deep wounds of hurt, lives marred, lives scarred, sinners smeared with filth smashed by sin it's very real just below the veneer of respectability and civility are corrupt and vile stains people who seem so civil earlier last week what happened midweek it just that layer the thin layer of civility was peeled back and what was really in the heart came out, spewed out. Oh, the facade, the camouflage of composure and peace. Beneath it, restlessness, no satisfaction. There you, I know this message is for, for you say, well, you say for the down and outers. It is. Thank God it is. They're as valuable in God's sight as you are. Derelicts, despondent, desperate, dark. It's for them. But it's also for the intellects. It's for the proud. It's for the polished, too. For you, would you like to have your sins forgiven right now? There's a societal search for inner cleansing. You know, sin stains. People work so hard trying to, oh, I'm going to say my prayers regularly. I, I was, I really messed up badly last week. And they worked so hard. But not one prayer, not one good deed, not one act of kindness. Holy communion can't take away your sins. Baptism can't take away anyone's sins. Sin stains. And religious concoctions cannot cleanse sin stains. Self-denials, penance can't purge sin. Indelible. Stain of sin. Will you say, what's the answer? I point you to the incomparable or the incomparable Christ. Through this man. See it? This man right here. We don't point you to ourselves or to our church. Remember this. If you're searching, we point you to this man, the incomparable Savior. 
through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. This man. Luke 15, verse 2, there were people who didn't like Jesus. And they said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You can almost see the scowl on their face and their furrowed brows and their measure of disgust in their tone. This man receives sinners. And I read that and I am so thankful. Praise God. Have you ever identified with that label? That reality? I'm not one for labeling people. But there's one label. I accept it. Peter, you are a sinner. And the moment I accepted that, I understood Christ, the incomparable Savior, died on a cross for my sins. Feel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you find any beauty in him? You know, when he was here, he was only a young man. He wasn't dressed in religious robes and wearing, holding a big scepter and no big special things on his head. No halo around his head. He dressed like a poor man. And yet he drew so many thousands of people. He was only in his 30s. But there was an undeniable power and undeniable authority as he went from village to village. All of Israel, the land of Israel, that came to see him. Thousands and thousands. Read about it. Read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will be so impressed with this man, Jesus. How long? Other than Christmas that's just behind us and Easter, how long has it been since you sat down and read the, the life of Jesus in the Bible? Undeniable power. He drew crowds. He healed people. He gave them hope for the future, and he still does. Oh, the refreshing distinctiveness of his life. There was no duplicity in his life. He wasn't a hypocrite. Even people like me who preach from an open Bible, you can say one thing on camera, and yet you could find out later that Peter is broken. That's why we point you away from every other human being. We point you to God who was manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. There is no brokenness in him, all refreshing his distinctive life. Who he was externally in public is who he was in private. Business people go to motel rooms and they do things in hotel rooms that they would never, ever do in front of their family. Two lives, not with Jesus. And you see how he reached out to the poor, those who were marginalized. There was a, not a, a racist or discriminatory bone in his body. It was for all. His arms were always extended to all. The all of different religions. He was ready to embrace them. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel. Oh, how refreshing it was. There was something about him. You know, when people are running for an election, I remember seeing something years ago when President Putin of Russia was trying to, you know, put a warm, gentle uh, face on and that he was among the people and people were very comfortable in his presence. And it was a photo op. And I remember seeing this picture where uh, President Putin um, in a crowd held out his arms to take a baby a child, a toddler, and he held out his arms and the baby went, <laughs> screaming. What was it about Jesus that parents took their child and they wanted Jesus to hold their child in his arms? He was only a young man in his 30s. I think there was something about his countenance that spoke of love and compassion and tenderness, and it's still there tonight. He is very interested in you. I don't know why you would keep him out of your life. I don't know why you'd turn your back on him. Why you would just uh, log out after this session and get go about your evening business. Why you just wouldn't bow in your heart and surrender before him and then tell him that you love him. Thank him for dying for your sins. The proof of his resurrection. Did you look at that recently? And the appeal of a relationship with him. The incredible scope, it's for all. The indelible stain of sin, nothing else can take it away. You could pray the rest of your life. 
You could give tens of thousands of dollars from now until you die, and it wouldn't take one of your sins away. You could go and confess your sins to a religious person, and they have no power because you didn't sin against them. You need to get forgiveness from God alone. And that's why it's this verse says through this man, through this man, God who came down in human flesh is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. You need forgiveness from him. God, would you like a relationship with Jesus Christ tonight? The appeal. Oh, we have a lot of horizontal relationships and sadly they unravel sometimes and they break. The strongest, happiest, most promising relationships often break. But if you enter into a relationship with God through personal faith in Jesus Christ tonight, vertical relationship, it will never be broken. Will you mess up in the future? Absolutely. But there is abs there is nothing because you're in Christ. The moment you trust him, he keeps you. You don't keep clinging to him. He keeps you safe. You're accepted in the family of God, not based on your own merit, but based on the value of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This man, Hebrews 10 says, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. People say, well, I'm not, I, I was I was to church today. There was another sacrifice. No, no, no. The Bible is so clear. There's only one sacrifice for sin and it happened 2000 years ago and there were, remains no more sacrifices for sins and first Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says there's one God there's one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus Pilate the governor before he allowed Jesus to be crucified he, he interrogated Jesus he knew that Jesus wasn't a criminal and he just said behold the man, what a man. Do you love him? Do you have peace? Do you have a relationship with him? Is he your savior? Or is he just a historical figure or a religious story? I can tell you that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. There is no stain too dark. There is no sin that is too vile. There is no deed that is too wicked. There's no crime that's too heinous. No thought to prefer it for his blood to cleanse. Here's what first John one verse seven says. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from most sins, all sins. The Bible records there's not one sin that cannot be forgiven. As I conclude. I'm just wondering, am I looking at into this camera tonight and maybe you're looking at me and you're wondering this sounds pretty good and it is good it's wonderful it's wonderful to have your sins forgiven to rest your head on your pillow and say thank god i'm saved i'm in christ i'm in the family of god if his old heart stopped ticking tonight one moment here in prince edward island canada and the next moment with Jesus Christ in heaven. What a way to live, but what a way to die. And you don't have that hope. You don't have that assurance. You don't have that confidence. You know why? Because you don't have Christ, but you could have Christ right now. I want to lean into you right now. Are you inside or outside the incredible scope of this message? It says all that believe down here all that believe the incredible scope are you inside could you say that's me would you like to have the indelible stain of sin expunged forever removed in god's records is your heart being drawn to the incomparable savior could you kneel in your heart as a sinner and with great openness that you've never experienced before, letting all your guards down and your defenses and your arguments, let them go. Because what else do you have? Christ could be yours right now. Incredible scope of the message for all. The indelible stain of sin can be removed. 
we point you to the incomparable Savior. But I have to tell you in all honesty as I close, it's preached unto you the inexcusable sinner. Preached unto you right there in the middle of the verse. Down the road, after death, in eternity, you will never be able to say, um, I'm sorry, but I never heard about Jesus. Forget about others right now. Inexcusable you, if you turn away Jesus, you could have peace right now. You could have the sins forgiven. You could be saved. You could rest this evening for the first time, knowing that Christ is my Savior. God is my Father. Heaven is my eternal destination. How much better does it get than that? Wouldn't you like to start the new week with that tremendous peace and confidence, forgiveness of sins?